And I'd like to share a message with you today that I had prepared for last Sunday. And it's one that I appreciate in my own personal life that I learned some things many, many years ago about this scripture. It's a scripture, and we're going to put it up on the screen here. It's a scripture that you're familiar with. It's found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And I want to read it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest, rest, rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The weight I carry. Have you ever heard these expressions? Have you ever maybe mentioned them yourselves? Man, I'm worn out. I'm burned out, and I'm stressed out. I would imagine all of us sometime have used those terms. Burned out, worn out, stressed out. Did you notice that the end of each one of those little statements is the little word out? <laughs> what does it mean I'm burned out? I'm stressed out. I'm worn out. It means that I've run out of my supply. It means that the reservoir is empty. It means that I'm out. And oftentimes in life, we find ourselves in this condition. It means that we're exhausted. God never intended for us to live a life such as that. I want you to listen to a scripture. I don't have it on the screen. It's found in Psalms 139. I love that portion of scripture. Talking about God looking in the mother's womb and, and seeing everything about a little baby in that womb. And verse number 16 says this, your eyes saw me when I was still an unborn child. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every day of that child's life that they're going to live was recorded in his book before one of them had ever taken place. We had a new great grandbaby born a week ago, little Judah. And I uh, got to hold him yesterday. But I was thinking when I read this scripture that when he was in his mother's womb for the last nine months, little Judah, God knew everything about him. Judah doesn't know this, but all of his days were already planned by God in his mother's womb. That's his plan. Even before Judah ever was born, they were all written down. God has a plan for us, a great plan. But oftentimes we find ourselves weighted down. We're burdened. Things are happening in our life, and we get worn out, burned out, and stressed out. The great invitation, notice on the screen, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. That is a great invitation. Come. Come unto me. Now, the last few months, I've had a lot of invitations. I had an invitation to go to an a, a, um, engagement ceremony, an engagement party. And Shirley and I went to that and had a lot of fun. I went to an anniversary party. We were invited to that. Come to the anniversary party. A wedding. I had some wedding invitations, and come, come to our, uh, to our wedding. The invitation. This is an invitation from God to come unto him, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I, uh, I messed up on one of the invitations, though. I don't want to mess up on this one. But um, Mariah, Brandon, I evidently must have marked the wrong, I hit the wrong button on the computer. You ever done that? I get more virus on the computer because I hit the wrong button. The week before they were married, they were walking out the door, and I said, hey, you got one more week to go. You can both just forget about it and get on out of here. <laughs> and they didn't want to do that. And I said, I'm looking forward to being at your wedding. And Mariah said, are you coming? And I said, well, yeah, I planned on it. Well, she said, you marked on the computer you weren't coming. I said, I did? I didn't know that. 
I said, is my wife coming? Yeah, she's coming. <laughs> okay. I said, can I come? <laughs> All right. And I came, and I enjoyed it. A great invitation. Now, sometimes you're not invited to a certain things, birthday party, because you may not know the people, and so we don't always get an invitation to everybody's uh, activity, okay? But the thing about this one is, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, all of you come. Everybody come. It's a very special invitation. All people are invited to come to him and to find rest. Come unto me. It's the greatest invitation that you'll ever receive is to come to Christ and to let him carry the burdens of your life. He invites you and me to do so. Notice he says in the next in the scripture, he said, all you that labor, all you that labor. That simply means growing weary and you're tired with toil, burden, grief. Your life may be overwhelmed. You labor. It's interesting. This is Labor Day. I guess it's an appropriate message, isn't it? We labor. It's hard work to live. It's what he's saying. You labor. You're overwhelmed. You're weary. You're tired. And then he uses the word burdened. What is he talking about burden? It means carrying an unnecessary load. I wrote down a number of things that we get burdened with. They're very simple things. Let me list some of them and see if you can relate to some of these that we're talking about. We can become laden with disappointment, despair, discouragement. Have any of you been discouraged this week? Well, I think most of you probably were. When I was up here last Sunday talking about Pastor Bruce, I would imagine that you became very discouraged. I did when I got that telephone call Saturday night. For some of us, it's almost despair. This can't happen to Pastor Bruce. And so we, we're burdened with it. Burdened this week with it. And God wants to carry that for us. We can be laden with sin, guilt, and fear. We can be laden with sorrow and cares and anxiety and depression, doubt, temptation, conflicts. I could just go on and on and on. I've been burdened with many of the things that I just mentioned in, in this message this morning. Despair, fear, doubt. And we get loaded up with these things. Hong Kong University did a survey on stress. And out of about a hundred things that they listed, they asked people, what are you most stressed about? What are the situations that you find yourself in? And these were the ones that I pulled out. I thought they were relevant to what we're talking about today. They get stressed over college. Any college students in here today? Are you stressed out? <laughs> yes, you are. You know you are. What do you want? You want to make grades, don't you? And hope somebody pays for it and all that. And so they get stressed out for college. Work. You all got jobs, or most of you do. Sometimes you get stressed out there. Money. Money. They get stressed out over money, right? Uh, you're a bunch of rich people. You don't get stressed out over money. You got stuff hidden away. Be like my wife. She's always coming to stuff. She's reaching back in her billfold. Well, where'd you get that? She, uh, she hides it from me, I think, what she does. <laughs> and so, but we get stressed over money and debt. We get stressed over debt. Sometimes we get just up to here in debt, and we, we can hardly breathe. And so we get stressed out. With life in general, you know, I just, I've come to the conclusion there are just some people just can't figure life out. And they get stressed over it. And then marriages. Many people, husband, wife, family, girlfriend. I don't know why you get stressed out over a girlfriend, but I guess you could. Relationships and all those different things. And so uh, we live uh, just in a very stressful, stressful world. But listen, listen to it carefully. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And ye shall find rest for your soul. What do you mean your soul? I need rest for the body. You shall find rest for your soul. What is rest? Rest means to cease from labor, means to refresh yourself and to rest up. Now I'm not a musician, 
but I do know enough to read music just a little bit that sometimes a composer, a composer will put a rest in his piece. Those of you who do music, you know what the little symbol is for rest. So what he does, he's writing that piece, and he comes to this point in that piece, and he stops. Rest. Nothing happens. Now, the beat continues, but nothing happens. It's a pause. Everybody shut up. Instruments, the singers, the beat continues, but there's a rest. It's a pause. In a spiritual life, that's what God wants for us. There comes a time when we need to pause, to find rest. Our life continues, the beat continues, but we need to stop. We need to rest. We need to slow down. Jesus said, I will give you rest. Now, how does he do that? Would you like to know? Or do you already know? Would you like to know? Well, he tells us right here. This is how he does it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Ah, a crazy yoke, huh? That doesn't make sense. When I think of a yoke, I think of a burden. I think of an oxen. I think of plowing. I think of pulling. What are you talking about? I'm going to get rest from a yoke? That's what he says. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he says, you got to take my yoke. Now the word take can mean a number of different things. It can mean take a hold of something. Like I'm going to take my wife's hand, I'm going to take a hold of her hand. Or it could mean to accept or to receive something. If Jim had a Bible down there and he wanted me to have it, I could accept it, I could take it and receive it. And that's what he's talking about. You are going to have to accept and to receive my yoke. You're going to have to take it. Now we don't want to do that because we think a yoke that means just more burden. Take my yoke. Accept it. Receive it. Yes, it is a yoke. Now let me give you a picture. I'm going to put a picture over here of a human being with a yoke. And I want you to look at this. You see that? Now that's the way most of us go through life. We got this heavy load upon our shoulders. We got burdens, we got pain, we got despair, we're discouraged, and we're just going to carry it. We're going to carry everything. We're going to carry our life, we're going to carry our marriages, we're going to carry our finances, everything that we are involved in in life, we've got it figured out. We are going to carry the load. And that's what we want to do. We are afraid to trust God to help us. Most of you probably are Christians in this building today. When you asked Jesus Christ into your life and you became a Christian, do you trust him that he saved you? You do, don't you? Of course you do. Do you have any doubt about it? Most of you don't. I got saved. I was nine years old. Man, it's written down. No problem. I trust God. That's it. Most of you probably believe that someday that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Or when Jesus comes. You have any problem with that? You probably think, yeah. Yep. When I die, or Jesus should come before then, I'm going to heaven. No problem. I trust Jesus. Don't we? But let me ask you a question. How much do we trust him between the time we got saved and the time we go to heaven? Well, now wait a minute. Now you're talking about something different here now. <laughs> I can't trust him with my life. I can't trust him with my things. I can't trust him with my marriage. He doesn't know anything about marriage. He's never been married before. I can't trust him. I just can't do it. But I, I trust him for my salvation. I trust him. I'm going to heaven. He forgave me of my sins. But I can't. I'm going to do this. I, I've got it okay, God. I'm doing pretty good. You know, the Apostle Paul 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12, said, For I know in whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, the day of judgment. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying that I believed in Jesus Christ. I gave my life to him, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep it. He's able to do it. He gave him his soul. He's able to keep it until Jesus comes again. And so that's the, the, the dilemma that we get into, is that we want to carry the load. Now, let me give you another picture over here of two oxen. Two oxen. This is a picture that oftentimes we think of. Jesus said, well, get in here with this. You get on one side and I'll get on the other side. And, um, but I don't think that's a picture. Because if I get into that, um, that yoke with Jesus, then I'm going to want to pull. I'm going to want to pull with him. I'm going, hey, Jesus, I'm doing pretty good. Let me, let me uh, pull this time. Okay? And we were talking about this in the office the other day. I think it was Connie that we were talking about and pastor before he, he left. We were talking about, is it a double yoke or a single yoke that Jesus is talking about? And uh, we really discussed it. And I think uh, she brought up the idea, well, there is a vertical yoke, and then there's a horizontal yoke. Okay? I don't think this is what Jesus is talking about personally. I don't think he said, okay, come on, get, get in here with me alongside. You pull and I'll pull. Everything will work. Now, there is a vertical or horizontal yoke the Bible says we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So as a Christian, I can't be married to an unsaved person. Okay? My wife and I, we are yoked together, and we pull together as husband and wife. That's what we're supposed to do. As a family, we got our children in there in the yoke. Understand that horizontal yoke. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about the picture that we're going to put up there right now. It's a single yoke. He says, uh, take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you. You need to get in here where I'm at. I do the pulling. I'm the one that gets us there. I want you to take my yoke upon you, that vertical yoke. That means this. He pulls the load. He carries the burden. He carries the anxiety. He carries the depression. He carries the marriage, he carries the bank account, he carries the health, and I could go on and on and on. He carries it. And if we get in that yoke, that's where we will find rest. Oftentimes, most of our life is really shaky. Sometimes it's, it's, it's shaking so much it's, it's about to tear apart. Just, just, life just shakes sometimes. We, we get so agitated. I want to give you an illustration in my closing today as to what it must look like when, when um, we're not um, in that yoke. And how life in the marriage is. Marriage is, boy, we just hit them like that. And kids, they go this way, boy, we bang that way. And we go to the bank account, we argue over the money. And, I mean, and we're just shaking. We're about, oftentimes we're about to have a breakdown. Sometimes we need to be redesigned. During the war, uh, Second World War, um, they began to um, develop jets, jet airplanes. And um, they were going so fast that they were getting so close to the sound barrier, uh, Mach 1, 761.2 miles an hour. And they were getting so close to it and it was October the 14th of 19, um, 1947. It'd be 70 years ago in October that Chuck Yeager took his X-1 and broke the sound barrier. If you haven't done any study on it, you would, I, the airplane that he flew is out in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. I've seen it. Mach 1. But what was happening, the airplanes at that time had kind of a blunt nose to it, kind of a cone that was a little flat around like this. 
And as those airplanes were being developed during that period of time, I think I probably have a picture of one of them up here, one similar to that, the nose of that airplane. And as they would, uh, the, the, uh, the sound barrier at that speed uh, is, is like hitting a wall. And those airplanes were having a hard time because of the design. They would hit that, that 761.2 miles an hour, and the airplanes would shake. And oftentimes, the instruments would quit working. Uh, they, they had a hard time flying them. Some of the glass in the airplane would crack. And uh, it was just really, really an interesting time. Well, they redesigned the airplane because of that. They, they designed them uh, similar to the one here. This is uh, Chuck Yeager. Notice the pointed nose on that airplane. And they finally got to a place where they could cut through the sound barrier. It's called the wall. And the old airplanes would hit it. Man, it would just shake like this. The new airplanes, the new design could cut through it and um, go up to I don't know how many miles an hour that they fly today. They redesigned the airplane. Why? Because they were up against a wall and they couldn't cut through that wall without damaging the airplane. It was shaking. Instruments weren't working. Life for many of us is just like that. We hit the wall and our life begins to shake. Our instruments don't work. Our mind, our emotions, our feelings, and we're just shaking. We just can't make it through that barrier. And I'm just simply saying this, that maybe it's time for some of us to redesign our life. And I would say that for our church with Pastor Bruce and what he's going through. Maybe it's time for us to redesign our church. Redesign. Maybe sometimes we're just living a life like this as a church. I know churches all around America are doing that. Maybe it's time we can cut through that wall. But we have to redesign our lives. But how do you do that? You get into that yoke. Take my yoke upon you, and ye shall find rest for your soul. But what is the soul? I, I played some golf yesterday. I told my wife I shouldn't have, but I just needed to get out and boom, 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 hit the ball. And last week I beat him, and this week I beat my son. And, uh, but, but, you know, uh, when I got home last night, I crashed out. My body needed some rest. <laughs> I turned everything off, and I just sit in a chair, and I just like a zombie, you know, and that's the way I was. But more than that, our soul needs a rest. Let me close just by kind of helping you to understand what the soul might be. You remember um, Martha and Mary? How that um, Martha was so cumbered about what she was doing. She burdened. And Jesus told her, says, Martha, look at Mary. She's sitting here at my feet. She's learning about me. Well, in this scripture here, Jesus says, come and learn of me. That's the most important thing. Once you learn about him, then you will have peace for your soul. What is your soul? What is it that we need rest for? We need rest for our conscience, for our spirit, for our mind, for our emotions, for the will to make decisions. God wants us to be calm there. He wants us to have rest for our soul. And when we do that, and when we get into that yoke, you will find there will be a transformation in your life. You really will. I know what life is about. I've got children, grandchildren. I'm around people all the time. Most of us have it all put together. But some of us don't. Into the yoke. Isn't that just a wonderful scripture? I bet you've heard that scripture many times. Come unto me all you labor and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. A meek, lowly of heart. I'll find rest for your soul. You've heard that many times. Probably when you were a little kid. But that's what God wants for you. For me. For Pastor Bruce. For Leslie. And that's what he wants for this church. While we're going through this period of time. that Pastor Bruce isn't here. It's going to be awful easy for us to get to the place where we get agitated, where we get um, 
trying to go through that wall and we get to shaking. That's not what God wants for us. He already has our, our days numbered. He knows what he wants for us. He wants us to have rest. He wants us to have peace. And that's our goal. As we move forward, as uh, the staff, deacons, members, ministry leaders, we are moving forward. Next week, Rachel's going to come and talk to you about a Grandparents' Day and the musical. And if Pastor Bruce was standing here right now, what I'm telling you and what we're doing, he said, that's exactly what you need to do. This is Glenville Church. Let's find rest for our soul and let's move forward.